gosh, great to be here with all of you this morning. Uh, I'm usually on the blue shirt team here at the 9 a.m. service with my husband and our baby who's now a toddler. Today, I guess I'm on the blue pants team, but I usually am on the blue shirt team with the greeters. But happy 4th of July weekend. We're really glad that you're here um, and glad that we have this opportunity to celebrate a little bit of all the good things that we have in our country. So I'm just going to take a minute to pray here for our country before we start into our, into our passage for the day. Lord, thanks so much uh, that we do get to live in the United States of America. Thank you for the many opportunities and um, gifts and privileges and freedoms that we have by living here. And we thank you for the way that you've been at work in so many ways uh, in our land throughout generations and generations. God, we, because we love our country so much, we continue um, to pray and to intercede for the areas that we long to be better and to look more like you. And Lord, would you help us and guide us in how we can be a part of those changes, being a good neighbor in our communities and be a good brother and sister and representative of you. We love you in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, we have been in a series on next level practices, the next level practices that are, we want to define our church. We've taken a look at things like knowing our identity and loving one another, at forgiveness and reconciliation and repentance and at humility. And this morning, we're going to wrap up our series by talking about a practice of respect for outsiders. Now, if you're anything like me, when you hear the word respect, one thing that might come to mind is that famous Aretha Franklin song, R-E-S-P-C-T, find out what it means to... Okay, I'm not going to sing the whole thing because I'm not Aretha here, but that R-E-S-P-E-C-T, find out what it means to me theme. We can like never forget how to spell the word respect after that, right? Now, I didn't know very much about the song, but when I started to do some research about it, I learned that it was originally written by Otis Redding back in the 1960s. And a few years later, Aretha Franklin, in 1967, rewrote the song, changing a few things, and then recovered it. And it's her version that we know. Most of us don't even know the original version. Now, if you know what was happening in the 1960s, it was the peak of the civil rights movement. And so all of a sudden, here is this black woman singing about respect. What did that mean? Was she trying to make a certain point? Different people were using this song as their anthem of the civil rights movement. But Aretha Franklin, when asked about it, said, I don't think it's bold at all. And this was her quote about the song. She said, I think it's quite natural that we should all want respect and get it. I think it's quite natural that we should all want respect and get it. So R-E-S-P-E-C-T, find out what it means to me. Now, many of us know what it feels like to be respected. We know that feeling. And maybe even more acutely, we know the feeling of being disrespected. If we think about it in terms of our Christian faith, we might know that feeling as well. What it feels like when people disrespect our Christian faith. It could be a raised eyebrow. It could be a, a work conversation where someone says something kind of critical about Christianity, not knowing that you're a Christian standing right there. It could be somebody's skepticism at how you're spending your time, their dismissal of your values. Those things, when we are believers and we hold our faith so dear, those things can be painful for us. But sometimes we get so caught in thinking about how, man, it doesn't feel good for us to be disrespected, that we can forget the opportunity that we have to show respect to others. We know as Christians we're supposed to love others and to do good, but why respect them? What is the value of showing respect to others? And how does it make a difference in our witness as Christians to the world and in others' perception of the church and of Jesus? And that's what we're going to take a look at this morning. To do that, we're going to get help from a couple passages, letters written from Peter and Paul, and then we'll take a look at a story from Jesus as well to see the impact that this kind of respect for outsiders, for those outside the church, can make. All right? So to get us started, let's open up to Colossians 4, 4 through 6, or you can take a look at the screen here as well. So this is a letter that Paul is writing to the church in Colossae. He says this, Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Now, at first glance in this passage, it may seem like it's sort of a random assortment of instructions, and that's normal for Paul at this point in his letters. Typically, at the end of each letter, Paul will give this rapid-fire succession of instructions to whatever community he's writing to. I think about it kind of like Paul's camp hug, okay? When you're hugging your kid before they go to camp and you tell them those last-minute instructions, like make sure to try new things, be kind, and please try to shower once this week, okay? Those are your maybe quick-fire instructions that you're listing off. And that's what Paul is telling this community about. So why is Paul focusing on how they ought to interact with outsiders? 
Well, the early Christians at this time, Christianity was actually a pretty new religion. And so people were getting used to what these Christians were about and what it meant to be a Christian. On one hand, there were very faithful Jews who loved Yahweh God and were following God faithfully. And so when they saw these Christians doing this Jesus thing, honestly, it sort of seemed like a cult. And it it seemed like maybe something to be concerned and worried about. So you have faithful Jewish folks on this end who are concerned about this new Christian community. Then, on the other hand, you have the Roman government, where it seems as though a strong religion is now growing. And we know from governments around the world that if there's a strong religious movement, it can lead to a religious uprising that upsets a government system. So, the Roman government on this side is concerned about these Christians. So, Paul then has to address these Christians. How are they ought to live? How ought they live in this environment where both Romans and Jews are trying to figure out who they are. What kind of impact can they make? How should they live wisely? And so Paul first addresses their actions toward outsiders, saying to live well with them, to be wise in the way that they act toward outsiders. How do we act toward non-Christians on our sports teams, in our workplaces, in the grocery store line, on social media when they post about politics? How do we interact with outsiders, with non-Christians around us? And what might be the opportunity that we have as Christians to make a difference? So Paul addresses the actions before he even gets to the part about the words. And see, then he starts talking about how conversations ought to be full of grace. Now, sometimes when we think about our conversations with non-Christians, we think, okay, I hope they know where I stand on these issues. I hope they know that we're different. And maybe then when they know we're different, we can still have a relationship. But Paul starts from a perspective of conversations being full of grace, grace being a gift that isn't deserved. How are my conversations with non-Christians around me, with outsiders, full of grace, a depth of empathy, of understanding, of free gifts through the whole conversation, the best assumption of what they're talking about? And only after that does Paul talk about the conversation being seasoned with salt. Salt always adds depth to a flavor palette, right? It should always be in every good dish because it adds depth to the flavor palette. And so adding salt into a conversation isn't just nice words, but adds a depth to the conversation to bring it a little deeper. Paul says that our actions and our words make an impact in how we interact with outsiders. So now that we've taken a look at the impact that this can make, let's take a little bit more of a look at what respect looks like. And for that, we're going to turn to 1 Peter 2, verses 13 through 17. It says this, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Now, Peter is writing in a similar context to the one that I just talked about, a group of Christians who's trying to figure out how to live in this world with a lot of tumult around them. And particularly, the Christians that Peter is writing to are going through a great deal of suffering. I think it's interesting that Peter starts off this section talking about uh, respect for authority or submission to authority when Peter himself seemed to have a few issues with this in his life. He was the guy who chopped off someone's ear, an authority's ear, when he didn't agree with the decision that they were making. So perhaps Peter's had some time to, you know, reflect and look back on his actions and have some different words that he's sharing with this Christian community. We won't spend all of our time on this, but I do want to give a brief word because there's so much in this passage about submission to authority that Paul or Peter isn't talking about a blind submission to authority, but rather a wise one that takes into account godly actions, okay? That could be a whole sermon, but I want to give a word about it so it doesn't distract us. Peter continues in talking about the way that these Christians ought to live, that we ought to live. And the line that catches me here is show proper respect to everyone. Show proper respect to everyone. I think it's helpful that Peter uses that word proper respect. Because sometimes we can get caught in these questions. Are we just supposed to respect someone? When with, is that supposed to be automatic regardless of what they've done? Is there a certain amount of respect that we're supposed to give to someone? What's the difference between being respectful and respecting someone? We can have all of those questions boil up in us. 
And so what Peter says is to show proper respect to everyone, which gives permission for that early Christian community and for us to see attributes of things that we can respect in people while still being okay with disagreeing with things or potentially not respecting every single action that someone does, but looking for the element of what we can respect, giving proper respect to everyone. Everyone is Peter's charge. So what might that look like? For me, I try to think about it as in any group of people or person, whether I agree with everything or not, what's the element of what I can respect? So I'm going to give you a few examples. I deeply respect the devotion of a Muslim student or faculty or individual who takes time out of their day when they could be doing something else to wash themselves and to pray. I deeply respect that devotion. I deeply respect the courage that it takes for an LGBTQIA plus individual or same-sex attracted person to come out or to share their experiences, especially with someone that they love. That's very risky, and I deeply respect that courage. I deeply respect the convictions of someone voting differently than me, especially if I have a long enough conversation with them about it. Note the part about the long enough conversation. Sometimes if I just see it on social media, it's harder to respect. But if I have an actual conversation, I almost always can respect a part of their convictions or something they're voting for or even agree with it when I sit down and talk with them. I deeply respect the intentionality that it takes to parent. Even if someone is parenting in a way that isn't Christ-like or that isn't involving Jesus, parenting has its challenges no matter how you slice it. And so someone who's going through the intentionality to parent well, man, I can respect that. My last example, I can respect the bravery that it takes for someone to pursue healing, even if they're pursuing it in a way that's different than Jesus. I believe Jesus is the hope of the world, but I can respect the bravery and the intentionality of someone seeking out healing and trust that God might be working. If any of those examples bubbled something in your stomach or you felt your heart kind of clench a little or you were thinking about it a little harder, I'd encourage you to spend some time thinking about it. You may have a different attribute that you respect than the ones that I mentioned, but sometimes certain people or groups can be easy for us to dismiss. But if we think long enough, if we pray, God, what can I genuinely, authentically respect to show proper respect to this person or this group? We might be surprised at the things that God invites us into. Let me give you a couple examples from my own life. So in my ministry role, I'm a member here at PCC. I I don't work here. I serve full-time with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, a campus ministry here, and I'm the director here in the Twin Cities. And so I work on all these different college campuses, secular campuses. I used to live in Wisconsin, and there I worked mostly with students. Like, I mean, it was pizza and retreats and a good time, okay? It was great. We had super meaningful ministry happening. When I moved to the Twin Cities, though, I was now in this role where I spent a lot more time talking with campus administrators and leaders. And so I went into one of these first meetings at a secular campus, and I went in thinking, I know students, like, which I do. Like, I've been around them for a long time. I know students. I know what they need. I definitely know what your Christian students are looking for, and I can serve them well. So I didn't go into the meeting with a whole lot of respect for the campus leaders, administrators that I was meeting with. I mentally felt sort of dismissive of their comments, and I think that came out in the conversation as well, of thinking, no, I don't really think that's what's happening, or yeah, everybody knows that. I didn't really need to know that. I went in in a posture of disrespect, and it made a difference in the meeting that we had. They could tell, and it felt like there was some tension in our relationship. And it impacted how I was able to do ministry on the campus. I didn't learn as much. I didn't have as many opportunities for partnership because I hadn't gone in with an attitude of respect that they probably did know a thing or two after over a decade on the campus and that there were things that I could learn from and ways that I could partner well to reach even more students on the campus. Fast forward a few years later, where maybe I, like Peter, had learned a few things, didn't chop off ears anymore. The campuses were starting to kind of perk back up after COVID restrictions, and it was really hard, particularly for student life professionals, to get the community going back on campus again after so many COVID restrictions. And so I went in that fall on campus, and I said, at this particular campus, I'm driving there, I am going to be respectful and affirming of whatever I can. Any kind of event they do, any effort they're putting in, whoever I meet, I'm going to make it my mission to be as respectful as possible and as affirming as possible. And I went in that fall doing just that. So they had an event. I found the person in charge of it, and I said, you did a great job. I really appreciated this, this, and this. Great work. I can see how hard that was. I offered to help with things. I'm grown now. Like, you can put me to work. Okay, I can do that job and this one too. 
Um, I asked how I could help or ways that, that we could be of service to the campus. I affirmed and I complimented what they were doing and I looked for things that I could genuinely respect and go home thinking, wow, that's a really great thing that they're doing on campus. That is excellent effort that they're putting in. And it made a difference. By the end of that fall, there was one person in particular who would come and talk to me every single time I came onto campus. I was extremely pregnant at the time, and she would always ask me how my pregnancy was going, how I was feeling, if she could help me in my cart through the doors. She would tell me things about what were going on on campus, and she never gave me any indication of Christianity or spiritual belief at all. But I hoped that by the end of that fall and our interactions, that she had felt respected by me, that she had felt her dignity as a human being made in the image of God through the way that I treated her, and that that was an opportunity that she got to have to experience the dignity that God gives her as someone that God has made and dearly loves. Our interactions with others have an opportunity to impact them, and our actions of respect have a deep opportunity to make a difference. But that's a story about me. Let's take a look at a story about Jesus so we can see how Jesus does this, all right? So for here, we're going to go to Mark 10. This is one of my favorite stories in the Gospels. So it says this, Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Now, Bartimaeus is a man who is definitely used to being disrespected. First of all, because of his blindness, he likely experienced a lot of marginalization socially, emotionally, relationally, and even spiritually with being left out of certain places of worship. Second, he's begging on the side of the road, which is a prime opportunity for someone to be disrespected. Third, people are actively telling him to be quiet. Be quiet, they say, even as he's trying to reach out to Jesus, the living son of God. They're telling him to be quiet, which is deeply disrespectful. And lastly, you might notice in the passage that while we learn his name, Bartimaeus, he actually is only referred to as the blind man throughout the entire passage. He's only referred to by his disability, by his hardship, by the challenge that's marking him. That might happen to some of us, or we might think those things about others in our head. But some of us have had those labels on us too. Can you imagine being called not by your name, but by the disability or by the hardship that you're experiencing? The drunk, the anxious guy, the depressed girl, the cripple. Those labels are deeply disrespectful, but it's so easy for us to give them to others in a quick bit of not thinking it through or of disrespect. And Bartimaeus knew what that kind of disrespect felt like. So here's a man, very used to being disrespected. But then Jesus, isn't that always how it goes? Jesus comes into the scene, and Jesus says, bring him over to me. So everyone calls, come over, Bartimaeus, come over. He's blind, so I'm sure his other senses were excellent after this time he had had of being blind. And so he makes his way to Jesus. Jesus sees him, calls him over, but then Jesus does something interesting. Jesus knows that Bartimaeus is blind. Literally everyone's calling him the blind man. So you don't have to be a genius to figure that one out. But instead of instantly just healing Bartimaeus without asking him any questions, Jesus stops. And he says, what do you want me to do for you? He asks Bartimaeus a question, a deep sign of respect. What do you want me to do for you? Bartimaeus says, I want to see. And Jesus says, okay, dude, you got it. You can see. Go on your way. A deep act of respect that we can show is calling people by their real name, seeing them, and then asking some questions. Sometimes because we as Christians, we have Jesus as the hope of the world, right? Like we love Jesus and we long for others to know Jesus. But sometimes even in our well-intentioned ways, we can go into people's lives or into spaces and just start acting, start healing or doing whatever without asking questions first. It's gotten some missionaries in trouble throughout history and it can get us in trouble now if we're not careful. What if instead we went into those situations with respect, 
asking a question. What do you want me to do for you? How can I serve you? What would be helpful? I think PCC does this in some great ways, especially when we think of Serve Day. Going to the city of Plymouth and saying, what do you need help with? Rather than going and being like, that park off 55 could really use some help. And I don't really know what's going on at West Medicine Lake on the evenings after 10 p.m., but we could help with that too, you know? Like, we don't go in and say what we're going to do. Instead, we say, city of Plymouth, what can we do for you? That's a deep sign of respect that can build rapport and build connection between Jesus and Bartimaeus. Jesus' actions with Bartimaeus there not only impact Bartimaeus because they bring him healing physically, likely socially, religiously, emotionally as well. They also impact everyone who's watching and these generations and generations of readers who read Mark, the oldest gospel, and are transformed by this story of respect that Jesus shows a man who was pretty used to being pretty deeply disrespected. When we see people, listen to them, and act, we have the opportunity to show them deep respect. So what might this look like in our own, our everyday lives? First of all, I'll encourage you to think about what person or group of people do you tend not to respect? One good indicator light could be anyone who you tend to refer to as that person or those people. Those liberals, those conservatives, those gays. You may say something like that in your head without even thinking it. Those people who lived out that part of the neighborhood. Anyone who's a that person or those people could be an indicator that you may need to, you may have the opportunity to do some praying and to consider how God may be inviting you to show respect toward them. Um, some that I have trouble with, just to start us here with vulnerability from the stage. Uh, I can easily do this with the opposite political party. I'm not going to tell you which the opposite is because it's only July. Okay, we're not going to get into that yet. Uh, but I can easily do it with the opposite political party, especially if I'm on social media. I can just have that instant disrespect reaction. Like, that's dumb. That's not helpful. So slowing down long enough to actually think or to pray and to consider what can I respect about this person or this group of people. Okay, so once you have that person or that group in your mind, I'll invite you next to do that work of asking God, God, how do you see this person or this group of people? And what can I genuinely respect about them? Remember proper respect. I'm not asking you for inauthentic blanket respect. I'm asking you to really consider what can you genuinely and authentically respect about that person or that group of people? And then how can you show it? Usually when we feel respect towards someone, we show it. It, it, we don't even have to think about it, but sometimes thinking about it can be helpful. I'm always surprised at the number of college students. I mean, I'm on some interesting campuses. These students think very differently than me. But I'm always surprised at the number of students who stay in relationship with me, even though we think very different things, because they can tell that I respect them. And it just goes a long way to actually respect, even if you disagree. So how can you show them that respect? There's this... Uh, adage or idiom or whatever that says you don't have to like them, you just have to love them. It's not in scripture, okay, but you all have heard that maybe. It's familiar to you. I do think that's technically true, and I think sometimes we apply it to respect too. You don't have to respect them, you just have to love them. And that might be true, but I'm not sure that people are going to feel our love if they don't experience our respect. I think that our respect for outsiders, our respect for people who are non-Christians, even our respect for people in this room, is one of the greatest ways that we can show them that they are full of dignity from a God who created them and loves them. That our respect has the opportunity to give people just a little glimpse of that God who made them and sees them and listens to them and will act on their behalf. And that that respect that we offer will point them more toward a living God. 1 Thessalonians 4 has this line about talking about the way that we live. And it says that in the way that we live, that we can make it our ambition to live a quiet life, minding our own business, working with our hands, so that our daily life may win the respect of others and that we will not be dependent on anybody. Our respect for others has the opportunity to beget their respect for us, which grows our opportunity to be a part of their lives in a meaningful way, pointing them to Jesus and sharing with them who Jesus is. On one of these campuses where I went in with that perspective of I'm going to be respectful, I'm going to look for every opportunity I can to show respect and show affirmation for what they are doing, I, I practiced that. I did it as often as I could. And by the end of that fall, I had campus life folks coming to me and sharing with me things about their actual lives. I was just trying to bring pizza to the staff and the students on campus, right? And there's campus life people telling me about their children's hardships, inviting me to even pray 
telling me about things happening in their marriages or crises of faith. It was incredible to see the ways that people were opening up and seeking a place where they could maybe have a soft landing spot for the pains in their life. And I was just a person, but I had the opportunity to show them a little bit more of the way that Jesus sees them, knows them, cares them about them deeply, and wants them to have full life in him. So our respect for others makes a big difference and shows them more of who Jesus is. This morning we have the opportunity to take communion together. And communion is an incredible act of Jesus dying. It's an act of remembering Jesus dying on the cross because of his love for us. It doesn't say the word respect in the stories about it in scripture, but I think it's an act of respect in the sense that Jesus sees us as full of dignity, worth death so that we could have life. And so as you receive communion this morning, I'll encourage you to rest in that truth, to know that you are loved and seen and valued by the living God, that Jesus cared for you so much to the point of death on a cross. And then to take that affirmation and that respect that comes from God and to live it out in the relationships in your neighborhoods, in your workplace, on your sports teams, in your schools. I could keep going to live that out in the relationships around us. 